All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for uh, giving us health to, today. Um, thank you that your provision for so many of us who've suffered uh, with sickness. Uh, it's good to be here today. I, I pray that as we look at your word that you will encourage us. I pray that you open our minds to the scriptures um, so that we can put the stories together in a way where we think your thoughts after you. Uh, would you help us today as we look at your word and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, please take quiz nine, uh, attendance uh, quiz nine. Uh, and anytime there's a problem with anything, if you do the wrong quiz or something, if you'll just email me, I'll be happy to fix that uh, for you. Uh, we're all kind of learning a new technological thing, and so there, uh, there are quirks to that. Uh, what we're wanting to look at today, these, these are the goals that I have as we look at this uh, discussion. Uh, I hope that you'll walk away from our examination today with the idea of God's uh, grace to the undeserving that when the Bible talks about salvation, it's not talking about God saving good people. Uh, it's about God saving people and making them good. Uh, I hope that we'll get a little bit of the idea of God's transformation of people today, that when God comes and saves someone, uh, it isn't simply to leave them in the situation they, they are, but rather it's to make them a man or woman of whom the world is not worthy. Um, and I hope that we walk away from today with the idea that God can use even horrific circumstances for his glory. Um, I mean, think of the worst possible thing in the world. Is it possible that God could use that uh, in his providence? And I hope that this um, discussion today will give us a love for uh, other people, uh, other people in s spite of some of the horrific circumstances they're in. And then also I hope always that we'll see uh, ourselves, a little of ourselves in the f faults of others. And so I want to jump into today's uh, study and I want you to be honest uh, what you think about this family. So we're going to look at a, a family in Scripture. Um, I'm not going to give the names when we go through, but uh, I, I believe that everything I say is actually uh, from Scripture. Uh, if we get to the end and you have some questions, uh, please ask, and I'll go... Uh, give the evidence uh, that I've found convincing for e uh, each of these things. But I want you to, to ask the question, what do you think about this family? And so I want to tell the story this morning of a man. And uh, what we know about this man is uh, that he and his family were idolaters. Uh, that is, in a time where uh, people should have been worshiping Yahweh and obeying Yahweh, this man and his family chose not to do that. Uh, they uh, decided that rather than worshiping Yahweh, they would worship idols. And what we know about what kind of idolaters they were is that they belong to what's called a fertility cult. Now, um, the reason we know that is because this man and all his family, or the vast majority in his family, had fertility cult names. Uh, they were uh, so into this fertility cult worship that all their names are related to that. And if you don't know what a fertility cult is a fertility cult is a place 
where people use uh, sex, and usually it's uh, a very perverse form of human sexuality to worship God. Some people call it uh, sympathetic magic, where people would do outrageous sexual things on earth in hopes of uh, inciting the gods above to lust, and if they copulated, then uh, uh, fertile families would happen on the earth and fertile crops. And when I say perverse human sexuality, um, the deities of a fertility cult included Baal, Ale and Asherah, that was the man and the woman. And then uh, Asherah had a son, Baal, and Baal had a daughter, Ashtoreth, and he had a sister, Anat. Well, in fertility cult worship, um, Baal and Asherah, and you may have, when you've read the Old Testament, read about Baal and Asherah, they're lovers in this fertility cult. And Asherah is Baal's mother. So a mother and son, as part of this fertility cult worship, were lovers. And Baal and Anat were lovers. Uh, and Baal and Ashtoreth were lovers. Uh, eventually, this fertility cult worship included uh, the murder of young children as part of this uh, uh, perverse uh, worship um, and when people what we know of these places of worship is that when people would go uh, and worship uh, these gods that they would observe priest and priestess uh, mimicking these relationships and so when I say that this man and his family um, have fertility cult names, they were so into this fertility cult worship that all their names are related to that kind of debauched worship. We're told in the text that they live in a place called the City of Lights, the enlightened city, and if we do research on that city, what we would find out is that there were tens and tens and tens of thousands of people there and they worshiped uh, a moon god who was called Sin and that uh, involved with this uh, worship of the moon god Sin there was massive human sacrifice. Uh, so uh, think of a family uh, utterly uh, debauched by Sin whose form of worship included uh, some of the most outrageous things you could even imagine. Um, and what we know about this man is that he and his family had turned to that kind of pagan, paganism while Shem was still alive. In other words, Shem is one of Noah's three sons. The world had become particularly uh, debauched in Noah's day, God said, I'm going to judge everyone. He did. Uh, there are eight people who made it through the flood. Uh, Noah and his three sons, and then Noah's wife, and the three sons' wives. And while Shem was still alive, this man and his family decided not to worship Yahweh, but instead to follow this pagan fertility cult. So it's a little like today if you met a family and they introduced the children and said, this is Joseph, this is Francis, this is Mary, this is Ignatius, this is Benedict, this is Loyola. You would say, ah, they're Catholics, right? And if you met someone and they said, well, this is my son Calvin, and this is my son Knox, and this is my son Thomas Watson, and this is my little girl Idolet, Italet is John Calvin's wife, if you don't know. Uh, you might say, oh, those people are Calvinist. Well, when we come to this man and his family and we hear the names, what we're hearing is just an absolute commitment 
to fertility cult worship. And where scripture says that is in a verse, it says, thus says the Lord God, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. X, the father of Y and Z, uh, they served other gods. So these people who are in uh, Israel's genealogy were not inherently good people. Uh, they weren't sinless people. They weren't people that you would look at and say, wow, what a uh, potential family. These were people who had problems and who had massive problems. And what we know about this man is that he had three sons. And uh, what his son's name, um, this guy, <coughs> his name may mean something like mountain man, or if it comes from a different root, it could be related to the word conception. Uh, we don't really know. We'll call him mountain man for short. This guy's name means snort, like a donkey snort. Uh, that was his name. That seems like a strange uh, name to me, to name a child. Uh, perhaps it's a fertility cult name. Uh, this guy's name uh, means one of two things. It could mean the gazelle. If it means the gazelle, uh, it has to do with the fact that the gazelle was associated with fertility cult worship. When I look at this man's name in Hebrew, uh, to me, it looks like the word uh, she shines. Um, and there, there are scholars who think that that's what his name is. And if it means she shines, then it probably has something to do with moon worship. Uh, they're worshiping the moon goddess as part of this fertility cult. And so this man, um, even though it's a man, his name means she shines. So we have uh, the mountain man, uh, Snort, and then we have uh, very much a fertility cult name, Big Daddy. So we have Mountain Man, Snort, and Big Daddy. And they're idolaters. They're committed to fertility cult worship. And uh, you say, well, prove that this happened. Well, if you go through the text, it will give you the years when people are born, and you just go through and you chart it out and uh, you find that uh, all these people in the circle lived while Shem was still alive. And so this idolatry, this fertility cult worship is happening while there's a living person saying God will judge sin, God will judge sexual sin, God will judge idolatry. But these men did not care about that. They wanted to worship the fertility cult. And the Bible tells us that that's true of everyone. Uh, the Lord looks down on heaven on the sons of Adam to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one person. So when you're thinking about the families that God saves, the option that you do not have in terms of, well, why, why does God uh, you know, interact with that one family? The one option you don't have is that somehow that family is good while everyone else is bad. The text is telling us there's not even one person. So when we start looking at what God is doing, and God doing with families, the idea that somehow uh, a family wasn't bad while everyone else is bad, that's just not an option biblically. <coughs> so this man and his family are idolaters. They're fertility cult worshipers. They're doing this while Shem is alive. And Mountain Man has... <coughs> excuse me, a son and two daughters. 
And this is what we know about the son and two daughters. This guy's name means cover up. Now, why in the world <coughs> why in the world would you name a baby cover up? The concealer, the one who hides things. Perhaps we're going to see in the story this girl's name <coughs> is something like Queenie. Uh, and the reason she's called Queenie probably is because in fertility cult worship, the full moon is called the Queen of Heaven. And so <coughs> she is given that fertility cult name. <coughs> Actually, I think this girl is Queenie. Um, the other girl's name is Poor. And we don't know why she's called Poor. Some <coughs> people think it has to do with perfume or, or something like that. Uh, but we have uh, Cover Up, Queenie, and Poor. And these are the three sons, uh, the three offspring of the mountain man. What we know is that the mountain man dies and that <coughs> Queenie marries Snort. Now tell me what the relationship of Queenie is to Snort. Snort is her uncle. She marries her uncle. Now, what does the Bible say about marrying your uncle? This is what the Bible says about marrying your uncle. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. Uh, same thing the, the other way. Um, then it says, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. And the list is included things like... Uh, don't have sex with your daughter. Don't have sex with your mother. Don't have sex uh, with your sister. Uh, don't have sex with animals. That's, that's kind of the list. And it says, do not make yourself unclean by any of these things. For all these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inheritance. So um, Leviticus uh, 18 lists a bunch of uh, things that God doesn't want to happen within human sexuality, and one of those things is don't marry your aunt, don't marry your uncle. Now, what's really interesting to me about that, just right off the bat, is that Moses wrote this. And Moses' father married his father's aunt. Which means that the person who wrote these laws is saying up front that the union that produced him was an illegitimate union. That seems really interesting to me. So here's what we have in this family. Uh, mountain Man dies, Queenie marries Snort, and they have a kid, and they name the kid Whitey. And the reason they name him Whitey is probably because of this fertility cult, the white of the full moon. So it's like the queen of heaven, uh, Whitey, cover up, um, marrying your aunt, your uncle. Uh, these people weren't just idolaters. They were committed to that kind of worship of God. And then we get to the really interesting part of this story. Cover Up has two girls, and the girls uh, do something 
uh, with their father, and it's so bad that they won't even list the names of the two girls. All we know in terms of their names, <coughs> excuse me, is the big one and the insignificant one. That's the two names that they're given. And this is what happens. Uh, there's a catastrophe in the story. And these two girls believe <coughs> that there are no human beings left on the earth. And they want to have children. And the only person who's alive is their dad. And they know their dad will never go for it. So what they do is they concoct a plan that they'll get their dad a little drunk, uh, not so drunk that uh, he's incapacitated, but uh, drunk enough where his in inhibitions are gone. And they each decide to sleep with their own dad. And two kids are born. And the names of those kids are amazing to me. So the big one sleeps with dad. And when she has a baby, she decides to name that baby from dad. What do you think his first day at kindergarten was like? So what's your name? My name's From Dad. Well, why are you named From Dad? Well, because my granddad and my dad are the same person. And because my mom's actually my half-sister. wonder what his first day at kindergarten was like. So the insignificant one sleeps with dad. <coughs> Names the boy my kinfolk. Huh. Those are some interesting names for two kids. Cover Up has two sons slash grandsons and they're named From Dad and My Kinfolk. Now it's not a prohibited um, union in the Bible. Absolutely that's a prohibited union. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I'm the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. You shall not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter <coughs> to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. So the word depravity is the word zima, in Hebrew, and this is where the word uh, zima appears. You shall not approach any one of your close relatives. Uh, it is depravity. Ezekiel 22:11. <coughs> one commits an abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. So. Clearly, <clears throat> what we have here is presented as just absolutely wrong. Uh, you could give the girls the benefit of the doubt. They thought everyone was dead. You could maybe uh, try to defend what he did, that he was half drunk. But really, there's no way to spin a good part of that story. This is bad. Uh, this was wrong. Uh, this was no defense uh, what uh, happened. What we know in this story is that 
uh, this man uh, was married uh, to a woman and these three kids were produced. The story doesn't tell us how this woman comes into play. Uh, we don't know if, if uh, this woman died. We don't know if uh, this is a mistress. We don't know if it's a second wife. All we know is that this woman and this woman uh, aren't the same person. And <clears throat> what we know is that uh, when this man and this woman came together, that they had a child. And if uh, this woman is a mistress, then this would be an illegitimate love child. Um, what we do know is that her name uh, means my princess. Um, if, if this is some illegitimate love child, uh, the man, while not acknowledging her as a rightful uh, daughter, would give her the name my princess, or perhaps it's uh, the mother giving that. What we do know is that my princess is about 10 years younger uh, than this person. So we have Mountain Man dies. Uh, he fathers queen, Queenie, Poor, and Cover Up. Cover Up ends up fathering children <coughs> from his own daughters. Uh, this prohibited um, union produces a man named Whitey. And then we're left with this figure. Who will this figure marry? Uh, what we know of the City of Lights is that there were tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. <clears throat> One estimate of the City of Lights that I read in the research was 125,000 uh, people. Uh, that's about the size of the population of Chattanooga. I don't know where those numbers uh, come from. I'm at the mercy of the scholars at that point. Uh, but imagine someone living in Chattanooga, and they're lonely. Uh, they would like to be married. And, you know, the, the thing, if he wanted to do what his brother had done, he would marry uh, uh, this girl uh, whose name is Pora, Porer. Uh, many people try to make the story uh, say that that's what he's done. Uh, that's not what the story says. The story says that uh, he married his sister, who was 10 years younger than he was. Same father, different mother. Now, uh, if you think about that, um, if... If he's 25 years old, we have no idea how old he was, but she would be 15. If that seems a little odd, uh, he would be 30, uh, she would be 20. Uh, we don't really know what happened, but we know <coughs> that while living in a city of perhaps 125,000 people, that the one uh, woman that he could not live without was his half-sister. And we're told in the story that they marry. Now, what would you think of a family like that if you met a family like that today? So we've got... Uh, uh, nieces and uncles married. We've got um, fathers who father children with his own daughters. Uh, we've got an incestuous marriage that produces um, this guy Whitey. And then we have a man married to his half-sister. 
What would you think if you met a family? I mean, what would you think if uh, you, you met someone, you fell in love, you went uh, to kind of the family reunion, and they started introducing these people to you and their relationship? What would you think of that uh, family? Would it cause you to have second thoughts? What does the Bible say about marrying a sister? You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter or your mother's daughter whether brought up in the family or in another home, if a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father, or daughter of his mother, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. They shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. The Bible is pretty clear that none of this is good. Cursed is anyone who lies with his sister, whether daughter of his father or daughter of his mother. This is part of the covenant blessings and curses. You have about um, 600, uh, sorry, about 300,000 men on two uh mountains about a mile apart so think of Neyland Stadium at University of Tennessee times three and the people are shouting out the things that will get you blessed and the things that will get you cursed and one of the things that will get you cursed is if you have sex with your sister one who commits abomination with his neighbor's wife another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law Another violates his sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, daughter brought up in your father's family since she is your sister. The Bible is absolutely clear. Uh, that kind of sexual uh, relationship uh, is illegitimate. So when you come to this family, would you say that the Bible would say that this family has great spiritual potential? Would you say that these are people who are somehow a cut above the rest of humanity? I think what most people would say when they look at this family is, yuck! Oh my goodness, this is, this is terrible. Do you know who this is in the story? Who is it? It's Abram. And this is Sarah. Uh, her name's spared Sarai at this point, my princess. This is Tara. This is Haran. This is Nahor. This is Lot. This is Milka. Now, I have to admit, I did trash her name up a little. Uh, her name technically is just Queen. Uh, so, but that's Milka. This is Ishka. A lot of people try to make Sarah Ishka, but Sarah is not Ishka. Sarah's father was Terah. That's what Abraham says. This is Laban. This is Moab. And, and this is Ammon. Now, who is the offspring of of Abraham and Sarah. It's Isaac. And a few generations, you get the 12, and you get Judah. 
And ultimately, <clears throat> you get Jesus from that line. Well, who's the most famous Moabite in the story? Remember her name's Ruth? And she ends up marrying Boaz? And Boaz and Ruth are David. So these these two lines are actually coming together in the person of Jesus. And <coughs> while we're uh, talking about Ruth for a minute, you know Ruth is a foreigner, right? And uh, her mother is Naomi, and uh, she has her sons intermarry with pagans, intermarry with Moabites. And the sons die, and she tells the two girls, uh, you need to go home and find other husbands. Um, and one uh, goes, but Ruth says, uh, uh, your God is my God, and uh, may God uh, do to me just horrible things if anything but death parts me from you. And you think, wow, that's great. That's great. But do you remember the advice that Naomi gives uh, to Ruth when they realize that there's a man, Boaz, who might be their kinsman redeemer? Do you remember the advice that Naomi tells Ruth? She says, uh, wait until his heart is merry with wine. Wait till he's out in the middle of nowhere. Make sure you take a really good bath. Make sure you use lots of perfume. When he's good and drunk out in the middle of nowhere um, and by himself, uncover his feet. That's probably a euphemism. And then Naomi says he'll tell you what to do. Doesn't that kind of sound exactly like this story all over again. So Boaz wakes up. The text says his heart was merry with wine. Boaz is so smitten in love with Ruth that when the opportunity avails itself, he gets married the next day. Okay? You tell me, how are two people... How eager are two people to be married if they get engaged and the next day at 3 o'clock they're married? Are they kind of eager to get married or kind of not eager to get married, would you think? I'm going to say he's pretty eager to be with Ruth. Uh, she's a beautiful woman. Um, she comes, uncovers his feet. He's half drunk. They're in the middle of nowhere. And you know what's going to happen. You've seen it on HBO a thousand times. Saxophone music's going to start playing and they're going to pan to the fireplace and you fill in the gaps. Right? And Boaz says, no. It's not right for us to be together. There's another who has a right to marry you. If he marries you, fine. If he says no, we'll get married tomorrow. Boaz kind of tricks the guy. Uh, offering land first and he says oh by the way you get uh, Ruth and he says no 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 I can't do that so Boaz and Ruth marry and then out of that line ultimately becomes Jesus comes Jesus now Is a man having sex in a cave with his two daughters while he's half drunk, is that a good thing? And yet somehow the God of the Bible could redeem that? I mean, didn't we all laugh at this little boy's name? Not realizing that he's the ancestor of Ruth, who's going to be the great-grandmother of David, who's going to be the ultimate ancestor of Jesus. The story of the Bible is not the story of God saving 
good people. The story of the Bible is about God saving people who are plagued, plagued with sin, and then turning them into men and women of whom the world is not worthy. That tells me that the story of the Bible is a story of hope. When God comes to Abraham, to Abram, he says, Go for your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. If you were God, would you be tempted to say that to a man who was married to his half sister and who had spent 70 years of his life worshiping in a fertility cult? where when they went to church, they watched people have outrageous sex, hoping that they could somehow lure the gods into procreating so that they could be fertile. God says to that couple, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless the one who blesses you and the one who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. God did not pick Abraham because he was good. God picked someone and chose to make them good. The story of the Bible is the story of God's grace. In the New Testament, we see that. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, that is, because of God, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that just as written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. How should we think of redeemed Abraham? I think we should think of Abraham this way, that before God's grace, Abraham was a really, really, really bad person. Sarah was a bad person. The whole family were bad people. But the scriptures say if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. When God's grace came to Abraham, it changed who he was. The old passed away, the new has come. Paul can even say, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. Uh, Abraham was changed by God's grace. Did he still have sinful tendencies? Absolutely. We're going to see that in his life. He still messed up. He still did things wrong, but at the core of who he was, God had given him a new heart. He was a different person. Jesus says that which is born of flesh is flesh. When we see Abraham apart from God's grace, what we see is fallen flesh, and he's like Everyone's fallen flesh. But when God began to interact with him, he was born of the Spirit. And so we see things like Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And we hear in Hebrews 11.38 of Abraham, the whole cosmos... uh, was not worthy. God came to a man who was married to his half-sister, who was from a, a family of fertility cult worshipers, who was an idolater, 
and God changed him into someone new. That's why he changes his name ultimately. He says, don't call yourself Big Daddy anymore. Call yourself Avraham, father of a great nation. And he says to Sarah, he says, you are not Sarai anymore. Uh, my princess, uh, maybe some kind of little love child name. He says, your name now is Sarah, which means the Lord's princess. This is a couple that had been looking for fertility through all the wrong ways. And God says, I'm going to make your offspring like the sand of the seashore. I'm going to make them like the stars that no man can count. And so what we have is these two lines coming together and ultimately uh, producing Jesus, the God-man. And it can say of Jesus, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. Uh, here, uh, just some things to notice that we have ten generations and three sons. This son is chosen. We have ten generations and three sons, and this son is chosen. <laughs> the Bible is inviting us uh, to read these stories uh, together. So, that's my uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted us, uh, when we started today, uh, I wanted to make uh, these points. So, in the four minutes, uh, three minutes we have left, uh, questions or comments or observations, uh, uh, any follow-up uh, things? All right, if not, I'll see you on Wednesday.